All right, Dr. Patel, have a great meeting. Thank you. Um, let me just share my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Akshal Patel. Um, I'm one of the neurosurgeons here at Swedish Medical Center, uh, working closely with SSF as the intro just started. Um, we are going to do our our monthly. We're going to do our monthly um, mock oral board review cases. Uh, these are uh, a train a way to train uh, our fellows and residents to get prepared for the oral boards. Uh, for neurosurgery. Uh, we're going to go through them just like we would on the exam, try to go through five to six cases in the time that we have. Uh, we'll try to stop early because people have to run to the OR anyway. And uh, luckily today we have Dr. Uh, Freivert from uh, UCLA, who's one of our esteemed colleagues and fellows this year in our spine program. He's working with Dr. Oskarian um, and Dr. Chapman and Dr. Hart and Dr. Abdul-Jabbar, uh, among others uh, in his fellowship. And so I have tilted the mock oral board review a little bit towards spine, uh, but you'll see that in a bit. So without further ado, I'm uh, gonna continue this uh, <coughs> slide here. Uh, so a 19 year old female uh, training for the Olympics noticed significant pain in her legs and mild weakness during the pole vault competition. Past medical history is not. Sounds good. Um, uh, any other symptoms, sensory uh, bowel bladder? Uh, she does not have any uh, bowel or bladder issues that she states. Um, she um, states that, you know, the sensory issues are basically numbness in her low extremities, but she can't really pinpoint that. And they're not all the time. They're very transitory. Gotcha. And, and no bowel or bladder issues? No bowel or bladder issues. Okay. Uh, I think uh, given, uh, given that I'd probably proceed to a physical exam. Yep. So here's her exam. Uh, she's afebrile, the vitus is stable. And you notice that she has some weakness in uh, plantar flexion bilaterally, um, otherwise five out of five throughout. You checked rectal tone, which is normal. And as I, as I said, she has some sensation issues and she kind of points out that it may be in her right calf. Gotcha. And uh, uh, one more time, can you remind me the time course of these symptoms? Uh, she did, she, it happened after her, uh, uh, you know, a pole vault uh, competition uh, as she was training for the Olympics. Um, she didn't have, she had chronic back pain before this, but she noticed this new weakness before the, after that. So. Sure. Uh, but is this within the last uh, several days? Yeah, several days. She okay. basically comes to the emergency room because of that issue. Sure. Uh, given, uh, given that, uh, I'd probably proceed to uh, an urgent MRI of the lumbar spine. And here you are. Um, on the left, you have a T2 image. On the right, your T1 image. Gotcha. Uh, there seems to be, uh, you know, for the most part, the MRI is, uh, uh, is, is free of any issues. There's no central stenosis, uh, no uh, disc herniation, but L5, S1, uh, there seems to be a, a grade one, maybe borderline grade two uh, anterolisthesis of, uh, uh, of five on one. Uh, do we have, um, uh, do we have the ability to see uh, the foramina? I don't have that image, um, okay. but I do have flexion extension in uh, x-rays. Sure. Um, yeah, it's possible that there's some, uh, some amount of instability with, uh, 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 with movement, um, or with flexion and extension. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't see uh, an obvious PARS defect here. Uh, uh, I think, uh, I would probably get a CT of the lumbar spine as well to better evaluate the, um, uh, the bone, um, make sure there were no, uh, no fractures anywhere. The CT scan shows that there is, she does have bilateral pars fractures and maybe some scar tissue in that region. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, in that case, given that the patient is, is symptomatic, especially with, uh, uh, with motor weakness, um, uh, I, uh, I think, and given, given her career, uh, I think, uh, urgent surgery is indicated uh, to, uh, you know, at the very least preserve what motor function she has and hopefully restore her back to normal. Um, uh, 
uh, I think given that there are pars fractures, uh, motion preserving surgery uh, isn't an option here. Otherwise, for you know, for an Olympian, I, I would you know potentially consider a, a disc replacement. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, I think uh, you know a single level fusion, uh, L five S one, uh, probably with a uh, with a T lift, um, uh, would be the appropriate way to go. Okay. Next case, um, 32 year old male uh, presents with severe arm pain, weakness, twitching of his shoulders and some mild swelling difficulty. Other than being 32, he's young and healthy, presents to your emergency room like this. Gotcha. And uh, what is the time course of these symptoms? Um, he's been having them, you know, he's training to be a police officer. And so he noticed that before training, which was several weeks ago, and the, the, the training or whatever it happens to be, he thinks made this all worse. Uh, and he's been going through the initial orientation and training to be a police officer. Gotcha. Um, uh, are there any sensory symptoms? Um, let me see if he, I'm not sure. We'll see. I don't think he noticed any sensory symptoms that uh, I recall. Um, okay. uh, any bowel or bladder issues? Uh, no bowel or bladder issues that he reports. Okay. And any gait difficulty? Uh, no gait difficulty. Okay, uh, in that case, and, and uh, no medical history, like you say. Okay, uh, in that case, I'll proceed to a physical exam. Here's a physical exam. All right, so we have uh, the multifocal uh, weakness in the upper uh, and lower extremity, uh, and he's hyperreflexive in the. Uh, Oh, it's kind of throughout. Okay, uh, you know, I'm I'm concerned for a, a for a myelopathy picture, but uh, you know, I suppose a, a QRE could also be in the differential. Um, I'd probably start with an MRI of the C spine. This is this. Uh, you know, the Merenstrom did a full you know MRI scan of CT and L, but this is the most pertinent image, the only image that has pathology. Yeah, I know absolutely, and and you know there does seem to be uh, there does seem to be some compression at uh, let's see two three four uh, five six. So at, at C five six, uh, there's there's definitely some um, you know degenerative disease with an anterior uh, uh, disc bulge, uh, and that uh, that cross section is on the right, correct? Um, so uh, you know I think. Um, uh, I think this uh, certainly merits uh, surgical intervention. Um, I'll, the, I'll, show the level, I'll show you the cross section below. That's cross section below. Yeah. And uh, how about the cross section above? Do we have that? Yeah, the cross section above is that. Oh, no, sorry, the above the first one you showed me. Oh, I don't have anything above this one now. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I would recommend uh, uh, probably again fairly fairly urgent surgical decompression, given that the patient has uh, uh, motor symptoms. Um, I do think uh, I do think there's you know multiple ways to do the surgery. I'd probably um, uh, I'd probably do a, a two level ACDF. Uh, I'm assuming that there's no um, no significant compression at that level above uh, if there. Uh, if there this is, level and then this level, perhaps. yeah, yeah, then, then I would do a two level uh, ACDF at those levels. That's two, three, four, five, uh, six. So at five, six, and six, seven. Um, uh, and that would probably be adequate uh, uh, to, uh, you know, to address this situation. Here's an x ray just to, you know, wrap things up. Sure. Um, yeah, no so, major signs of instability. No. So you do your ACDF. Um, and, uh, he does, uh, he feels great off the ACDF. Um, you see him at six weeks post-op and he still states that he has weakness, um, which is getting worse in his upper extremities. Um, you know, I do a, I do a physical exam at that point. Uh, physical exam, uh, we, it's very similar to the physical exam we have here except now you notice that his uh, bicep and tricep is a little bit weaker uh, still than your initial exam. Low extremity weakness is similar to pre-op, but the weakness in the uppers seems to be more significant and continues to be slightly hyperreflexive. 
Yeah, uh, uh, at that point, I would progress to uh, you know to urgent imaging. Uh, certainly, a CT to evaluate the the hardware, uh, and then uh, unless there's something obvious on the CT, uh, an MRI uh, to evaluate the soft tissue. I don't have a CT to show you, but the uh, CT scan uh, looks fine. The hardware is in good position, no issues, um, and you actually you actually end up doing a CT myelogram just to make sure. And that does not show any residual osteophytes or problems with the hardware. Everything seems to be everything seems to be in appropriate position. Uh, okay, so so in that case, the uh, the patient has. Um, uh, let's see. Ah, uh, okay. Um, can I review that MRI again? Yeah. This is the mm -hmm. pre-op MRI, but the post-op MRI scan looks a lot better. Yeah, uh, you know this is this is concerning for uh, for an alternate pathology. Uh, the compression, you know, while while present, isn't uh, uh, isn't incredibly significant. It is possible that the uh, you know the patient has uh, an alternate cause for his um, for his pathology, something like. A, uh, you know, an inflammatory disease. Um, I think uh, I would probably initiate uh, workup with um, uh, an LP uh, looking for uh, either inflammatory markers uh, or, uh, um, you know, oligoclonal clonal bands, something along those lines. You do the lumbar puncture uh, and they don't say that there's any uh, inflammatory issues or oligoclonal bands. Um, you mentioned that there could be an alternate pathology going on. Uh, what else on the differential other than uh, multiple sclerosis that you, you may want to consider? Um, uh, so uh, transverse myelitis uh, uh, would, would certainly be an option. Um, uh, it's also possible that there's something going on, uh, uh, you know, cranially, although those symptoms wouldn't necessarily uh, match, uh, but but transverse myelitis would probably be next on the uh, on the differential. Give me one more, Doctor Freiberg. Um, uh, you could have uh, NMO. Uh, you could have uh, ALS. Um, okay. All right. Um, we'll move on to the next case. Uh, Seventy-two-year-old uh, female uh, presents with cranial cervical junction pain. Uh, she has some left suprascapular pain and some generalized uh, headache as well. Um, her pain has been chronic and she has bilateral eye soreness as well. Um, we're not sure if that's related and her possible is for depression, chronic headaches and hypertension. Okay, um, let's see, craniosphericle junction pain. Um, okay. Uh, 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 what is the chronicity of these symptoms? Sorry? Uh, uh, how long have these symptoms been going on? Oh, uh, these symptoms have been going on for a very long time. She uh, has been putting off going to see a doctor uh, for what she says is years. Um, and when you go to see her, uh, she has her head cocked to one side because of her chronic pain. Um, and like I said, this is going on for years. She's only showed up to your clinic because recently she's been having issues with her neck pain worse than usual. I see. Um, okay, is she on any uh, medications of no blood thinners, anything like that? Uh, she's no blood thinners, good question. Um, she's on some medications to treat her hypertension, which is mild. She's on hydrochlorothiazide. Her chronic headaches, she's been on and off of medication in the past, including gabapentin, which have not worked and uh, she's on an antidepressant. Okay. Um, in that case, I'd proceed to a physical exam. Uh, this is a physical exam. No issues with her, vi uh, with her vitals in the ED. Uh, her neck has limited rate of range of motion uh, and her head is cocked to one side as, as I mentioned earlier. When you try to move her neck and shoulder, uh, she, you elicit pain um, as she tries to, as you try to move her head to one side. Uh, and as you ask her to raise her left shoulder, you don't have any uh, objective concerns for any weakness and her sensation is completely intact. And I didn't mention reflexes are also uh, intact. Okay, uh, I'd, uh, uh, I'd acquire uh, plain films to start. 
Um, I think because this is the emergency room and this is America, we're going to get a, a uh, an MRI scan first. And I just put the most useful cut uh, on the MRI scan as well, uh, high up, and the rest of the the rest of the MRI scan is there, the sagittal T two. Uh, let's see here, uh, and and approximately that's that's at the you know at the. Uh, Cranial cervical junction, as you're saying? Cranial cervical junction, C1, is what you're seeing on the right-hand side, T2 image to correlate with the other image on, on the left as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't see any obvious signs of, uh, uh, any obvious signs of uh, compression. Um, uh, there's not, um, uh, and on the, um, uh, on the fat sat sequences, are there any signs of edema or? Uh, or anything along those lines? I'll give you a CT scan is what the emergency room can give you. Um, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, looking at the CT scan, sagittal, uh, coronal, uh, axial cuts, uh, it looks like, um, uh, it looks like we have uh, kind of a, uh, uh, pretty diffuse degenerative disease of the craniocervical junction. Uh, I don't see any obvious uh, uh, dislocation or, um, or acute uh, fracture. We don't have a midline cut uh, showing the, uh, the dens. The dens is not fractured, but good point. Um, okay. There's no issues with the dens itself. Sure. Um, uh, you know, I'm not really seeing uh, necessarily an uh, an anatomic uh, cause for her symptoms. Um, I think... Uh, Here's a CTA just to help out as well. Yeah. Um, the the uh, vertebral arteries appear uh, patent. Uh, carotids uh, don't show any obvious... Uh, oh, carotids are patent as well. Yeah. Um, the radiologist helps you out, and he says that there is uh, a, a mass of our hyper, hypertrophy, hyper, hyper, hypertrophy tissue uh, on the screen. You can see my arrow here. Yeah, on, um, the, on the left side. Um, you know, given, uh, given that the mass is, is calcified, uh, I probably, uh, you know, I'm not particularly concerned that this, this pathology is acute, but it is possible that it's causing her, uh, uh, you know, some extent of her pain. Um, I think uh, my next move would probably be to request a, a needle biopsy uh, to see if we can get a tissue diagnosis. You do a needle biopsy, it's uh, just shows sclerotic bone, nothing pathologic to it. Uh, and the patient is, uh, uh, is 72? 72, no yeah. other issues. I would just probably follow this with serial imaging and refer her for, um, uh, you know, for symptomatic management with, uh, with primary care for her, uh, uh, for her neck pain. Um, her um, uh, her uh, torticollis, which I think is you're describing, um, uh, can probably be managed with muscle relaxers. Okay. Uh, you, go, you go the con conservative route. She seeks a second opinion um, and... She ends up getting operated on by one of your orthopedic spine colleagues. Um, and during that procedure, uh, you're in clinic hanging out um, and suddenly you get a call from OR6 uh, that your orthopedic spine surgeon needs your help step. Uh, you walk in there and uh, he's having a hard time with uh, blood and bleeding. And he thinks that one of his screws has hit the vertebral artery. What would you like to do? Uh, is, that, uh, is that screw still in position? Uh, the screw is a uh, halfway in. He's got padding. He's got some, uh, you know, some cottonoids there trying to hold pressure, um, but he doesn't know what to do. He does not know what to do next. Yeah. Uh, so I would, I would recommend uh, uh, committing to the screw, packing off the bleeding uh, with uh, serial uh, hemostatic, uh, hemostatic agents. Um, I wouldn't use any kind of liquid agent like flow seal to make sure that, uh, you know, we don't risk, um, uh, we don't risk embolization. Uh, of course, in parallel, I would uh, I'd make sure that anesthesia was notified of the you know risk for massive blood loss. Uh, I would um, uh, I would make sure that you know the massive transfusion protocol was activated, uh, uh, obviously to um, 
to, to prevent a threat to life. Uh, and then uh, once uh, once we obtained uh, hemostatic control, uh, I would uh, make sure that the patient was emergently taken for angiography to evaluate the extent of the vertebral artery, artery injury, uh, see if there's a pseudoaneurysm, uh, if something needs to be uh, sacrificed. So this is um, the image of that left vertebral artery um, from the angiogram. Your your angiographer is a is a radiologist. Um, what yeah. kind of key? Be, it, it, what kind of you mentioned pseudoaneurysm? What else is key? What one other thing is key for you to ask for the? You know, you he, you mentioned that it's a left vertebral artery injury because the left hand side screw might have caused it, um, and so he shoots left vertebral artery. Uh, no pseudoaneurysm. What else would you like him to do? Uh, you want to make sure that there's good collaterals, that the left side isn't the dominant side. Uh, uh, and then uh, I would probably request all, uh, all four vessels and an evaluation of the circle of Willis, uh, just to make sure that if, uh, uh, if a vertebral artery sacrifice was necessary, um, that, uh, 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 that it would be feasible, uh, you right. know, and we wouldn't cause massive strokes. You do that, and uh, you luckily, uh, for your orthopedic colleague, the patient has a another vert on the other side, which I, I think you kind of confirm with the preoperative CT imaging. Yep. Uh, case four: a 34-year-old gentleman presents with low back pain and bilateral abdomen, uh, sorry, bilateral um, lower abdomen, uh, extremity numbness uh, and tingling. Uh, his numbness is from the lower belly to his mid thigh, and this happened, as he states, he works uh, in an Amazon warehouse, uh, heavy, lifting a heavy item and hearing a pop in his back. So this happened earlier today. Uh, he came to the emergency room and this is where we're at. He's a cannabis user, we're in Washington. And so he also microdoses neurotoxic mushrooms as well. Gotcha. Um, uh, let's see, so, uh, and uh, any bowel or bladder issues? No bowel or bladder issues. Um, he just noticed that uh, he, the severe pain in his back, and now he's got some decreased sensation there. Mm. And and uh, no history of blood thinning medications or anything like that? No history of blood thinning medications. He's been perfectly healthy all of his life, um, didn't go to college, hadn't seen, has never seen a doctor, now works on Amazon. And uh, as I said, the only medical history that he knows of is just the, the, the use of substances. Sure. Uh, I'd proceed to a uh, physical exam at that point. For exam, he's uh, afebrile. His vital signs are stable. Uh, no issues with that. Um, he noticed you noticed on exam that he's got some knee flexor extensor uh, weakness, four out of five. Dorsiflexor, four out of five. And when you do a sensation exam, he's got decreased sensation of pinprick and vibration below the T7 dermatone, which is just above the navel. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I'm, I'm concerned for uh, an acute uh, injury to the. Uh, to the T-spine. And sorry, uh, um, what are the patient's uh, uh, reflexes one more time? Uh, his reflexes um, are slightly hyper, hyper reflexive. You don't know if that's just um, uh, him or, um, you know, uh, he doesn't know if it's just uh, him uh, being like, you know, a, a young individual or just being hyper reflexive in general, but I don't think he knows anything major. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, so I would probably proceed to an MRI of the T-spine at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, you know, there, uh, there appears to be an acute uh, uh, disc herniation with associated uh, uh, cord signal change uh, kind of in the, um, uh, the mid-thoracic uh, spine. Um, do we have uh, any idea what levels those are? Um, I believe it's T7. Uh, is the exact level. Uh, uh, yeah, your sorry. radiologist helps you count. Uh, T7, T8, uh, or? Yeah, T7, yeah, so T7, T8. So on my arrow, T7, T8 here. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, so you know the, the patient is presenting with uh, uh, acute uh, neurologic compromise from uh, you know from what appears to be a, a, a disc herniation at T seventy eight. Uh, I think uh, you know this requires uh, urgent operative intervention. Um, uh, given that uh, uh, given that this is uh, a thoracic disc, um, and given that the patient has a uh, you know a healthy amount of kyphosis, uh, this can't be achieved with just a posterior decompression. Uh, a slightly more aggressive surgery has to be done with a, a posterior decompression, followed by um, uh, possibly a transpedicular uh, uh, approach to. Um, 
uh, to go around and and uh, uh, extract the disc or at least uh, uh, separate it what, anteriorly. What would you do, Dr. Freiber? You're, you're consenting the patient and you're trying to plan the surgery. Yep. What would you do? Uh, I would probably consent the patient for a, a T6 to uh, T9 um, uh, fusion, uh, T7, uh, T8 uh, uh, laminectomy, and then a, uh, uh, a transpedicular approach for uh, discectomy. Okay. Um, that all goes well. No issues with that. Um, Post-op, uh, you notice that... Um, patient has uh, some fluid leaking from his back um, and you're concerned it's clear, what would you like to do? Uh, I'd ask the patient if he has uh, any headaches, uh, especially positional headaches. He does have positional headaches. Okay. Uh, you know, I'd be concerned for, uh, uh, for a CSF leak. I'd probably start with, uh, with conservative management by placement of a, a, a lumbar drain uh, and then having the patient uh, uh, remain supine for um, uh, 24 to 48 hours and then reassessing at that point. Uh, you put the lumbar drain in and despite the lumbar drain after 48 hours, he's still can have, if the leak has lessened or this fluid coming out of his wound is lessened, but it's still present. Okay. Uh, is it uh, significantly diminished or only slightly? Uh, it's slightly diminished, but now you notice there's fluctuations below the skin uh, now, yeah. so there's a bubble forming there. Yeah, I think I think at this point it's it's uh, probably reasonable to go and re-explore uh, and uh, attempt a, a primary repair of the you know the cult CSF. You do that, everything turns out well. Uh, case number five. A uh, 60-year-old male presents with uh, left leg weakness. He has tightness in his right anterior thigh and occasional cramps. Uh, his right leg seems to function relatively well. Mainly the left leg has been causing the issues. Um, he has some difficulty voiding, uh, some urgency and constipation. Um, he has uh, chronic left side low back pain, but no mid back pain. There's no abdominal numbness or issues with that. In his post history, at a 60-year-old, he's had prior kidney stones uh, and had to pass them. Diabetes mellitus, uh, which has not required insulin treatment and uh, hypertension, which is being treated for by medications. medications. Gotcha. Uh, and then uh, once again, what is the, the time course of these symptoms? Uh, this has been going on for uh, several weeks to probably a month or two. Um, yeah, I think he noticed, I believe he noticed it when he was, you know, cutting grass this, this summer. Um, it's just been getting worse. Gotcha. Um, uh, okay, in that case, I'd proceed to a physical exam. Physical exam as such. Uh, he has got no issues his, uh, in terms of his vitals, no hypertension, nothing like that. Um, you notice that he has three out of five left quad hamstring and um, weakness on that side, but he also... Uh, have a trusty medical student with a tape measure who noticed that when they measure his uh, upper leg diameter, it's significantly different uh, from the right side. And that is noted as atrophy mm. and sensation is diminished in his left leg and the reflexes are absent on that side too. Okay. Um, uh, you know, these symptoms are, are uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit atypical, but um, uh, I would, uh, I would probably, uh, check for, um, uh, sensation in the saddle area, uh, as well as rectal tone. Rectal tone is present, uh, but weak, and he's got slightly diminished, although it's not completely absent, uh, saddle, uh, or, you know, peri anal, uh, sensation is, is intact, but weak, but, but less than appropriate. Okay. Um, I think imaging is appropriate at this point. I'd probably get an MRI of the T and L spine. So, sorry. Uh, an MRI here's of the, the T and L spine. Here's the uh, L spine image first. And you have a stir on the right. In the middle, you have a T2. On the left, you have a T1. Can you describe what you see? Um, uh, I see a, a grossly... Uh, a grossly normal uh, MRI, except that it appears to be uh, enhanced uh, or, or uh, uh, intrinsic cord signal in the um, uh, in the conus. Um, uh, and then, uh, do we have uh, do we have a T spine? T spine. 
Yeah, yeah. It seems like uh, you know there's there's multi-level uh, uh, signal uh, uh, increased uh, signal intensity in the conus. Uh, I also might be imagining this, but there seem to be um, uh, there seem to be vessels of increased caliber, uh, kind of at the posterior aspect of the of the conus, at least on the uh, on the T two. Um, um, you know, my concern here would. Uh, be potentially for a uh, dural AV fistula, and we could be seeing a kind of a, a foie la junine picture. Uh, I think a, a reasonable next step would be to uh, to send the patient for a, a spinal angiogram. This is the images of the spinal angiogram. I believe I've marked them at left T12, left T1, and left T, oh, sorry, sorry, left L1 and left L2. Uh, and these are the images. What do you see? Um, let's see. Left T12, left L1, and left L2. Uh, I, I, I think I'm seeing multiple, uh, multiple levels of uh, abnormal vasculature and uh, I think uh, premature venous drainage. Um, uh, this this does seem to be a, a dural AV fistula. Um, based on uh, based on these findings, I would uh, I would probably uh, request an attempt at embolization. So uh, your intrepid uh, radiology colleague um, is able to do a highly selective angiogram, um, but does not feel comfortable uh, doing an embolization procedure uh, on this patient. Um, but tells you the gold standard is surgery uh, yeah. for the, in this case. So, what would you like to do? Yeah, no, uh, I, I think if the you know for for any of complex fistulas, uh, uh, surgery is very reasonable. Um, I think this uh, this patient would benefit from um, uh, laminectomy, uh, exploration, um, and uh, uh, you know ligation of the of the dural AV fistula. How would you find it? Describe your steps of your surgery. Um, uh, you know, so I, I would consult with the uh, with the uh, interventionalist to uh, to make sure that there was um, you know that my interpretation was correct and that there were multiple um, uh, uh, multiple levels involved. It looks like here the um, uh, L one on the on the left is the main uh, the main fistulous focus. Um, uh, so uh, one uh, one good option is to have uh, uh, ICG uh, or uh, a similar fluorescent agent uh, in case the vessels aren't obvious when the laminectomy is performed. Um, uh, in that way, you can use uh, you can use fluorescence to uh, to help localize the abnormal vessels. Um, and uh, any other adjuncts that you would use uh, to help you with the surgery? Uh, just in terms of uh, in terms of surgical preparation, I mean, you could you could consider using intraop fluoro just with with standard uh, uh, with standard uh, dye to uh, to help visualize things intraoperatively. Again, if things are difficult to find, just uh, just in the open. Uh, and then, of course, I would uh, you know, like for any uh, any vascular surgery, I would prepare for the possibility of uh, uh, significant blood loss and and you know, urgent hemostasis. Moving on to the final case, 77-year-old um, uh, female presents to the emergency room after witness fall at home. Uh, she lives, her, uh, lives on her own, you know, perfectly independent at her age, um, lives in Montlake Terrace. She complains of severe neck pain when she's brought to the emergency room. Uh, they had put her in a, the EMS had put her in a collar because of her neck pain. She has diffuse arm and leg pain weakness um, that you notice. Um, and past medical history is the, what you would expect in a 77 year old female from the Pacific Northwest, osteoporosis, mild hypertension um, that she has not treated, uh, and intracranial atherosclerosis for which she's on warfarin. Uh, sorry, for which we, she's on warfarin, but also for the treatment of her AFib as a, as a double whammy. Um, and she's had a remote history of stroke in her early 60s. That's about it. Gotcha. Uh, she, uh, she remembers the fall? She remembers the fall. Um, she was at home, uh, you know, with a neighbor at, you know, having breakfast with a neighbor. Um, and basically this was early in the morning and now she's been brought to the emergency room.
Okay, and and the fall uh, was witnessed and described as mechanical, or was there a seizure event or less of? No, less no seizure events. No seizure event. She just tripped up and fell uh, while okay. she was serving breakfast. Okay, uh, I'll proceed to a physical exam. This is the physical physical exam. She's awake, responsive, no issues. No, you don't consider any co cognitive issues. Uh, your cranial nerve exam. Uh, because you're worried about given her history of stroke in the past, but no issues with her cranial nerves. Um, on exam of her extremities, the bilateral upper extremities are two out of five in the proximal muscle groups and one out of five distal muscle groups. So you're concerned about that weakness. And then the lower extremities are three out of five throughout. Um, she's decreased sensation, light touch, and pinprick throughout, worse in the arms, worse in the upper extremities. Yeah. Um, and the reflexes are steady. Okay. Um you know, given these findings, I'm I'm uh, concerned for an acute uh, acute spinal cord injury. Uh, I'd probably proceed to uh, to plain films and then an MRI of the cervical spine. Plain films look okay. Um, cervical spine MRI scan looks like this. Okay. Uh, so uh, you know, there's there's some uh, spinal cords. Uh, spinal canal stenosis. Uh, I think I'm seeing some um, uh, some signal change. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, there's. Uh, uh, I also probably get a CT scan just to just to make sure there were no obvious fractures uh, if the plain films were unrevealing. This is the most obvious thing on the CT scan. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there seems to be an acute, uh, uh, acute displaced, uh, posteriorly displaced uh, uh, dense fracture. Um, uh, and then can we go back to the MRI one more time? Sure. Yeah, with uh, with no neurologic uh, compression. So I, I think for... for uh, Radiologist says that there's some core signal change here. Yeah, um, I think for uh, uh, for neurologic purposes, uh, uh, decompression is um, uh, not necessarily indicated, but the patient does have um, an acute fracture. And uh, I think given the displacement, um, uh, there is a need for, uh, uh, for stabilization. Um, uh, I, I think uh, given that surgery uh, at this point is uh, uh, going to be indicated, uh, I think it's reasonable to perform decompression of the, uh, you know, of the levels with signal change at the same time. Excellent. So what would you like to do? Um, uh, I think I'd, uh, can I see the MRI one more time? Sure. Uh, let's see. Um, it seems like the signal change goes down to, uh, to maybe uh, five, six. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, uh, a C1 to, um, uh, to T2 uh, fusion uh, with decompression at uh, uh, the levels where their signal change would be reasonable. Okay, excellent. Um... In the interest of time, that's what that's what it looks like. That's exactly what you did. I don't think you went down to T2 necessarily, but you went low enough. C1 to C6, I think. Anyway, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Freibert. That was excellent. I'll since we're that's that at the, I think I have more cases, but I'm going to cut it short there since we're all busy in the OR today. Um, we'll go through the cases really quickly and some pointers. Um, the first pointer is that uh, Dr. Freibert did an excellent job with pacing. Um, and so uh, you want to get to the point and you want to keep an eye on the point. And as, and uh, we were talking before this, uh, Yev and I were talking before this, uh, this board, Mokoro board review, and he's had some practice in his residency uh, when he was probably a chief resident um, at UCLA that going through some of these cases. But the most important thing is not being uh, stumbled, not, not having to stumble through these cases, but actually keeping that in mind that you're going to get through these cases. Um, first case is kind of controversial. All of these cases are cases that you could see both in the uh, spine section, if you chose that section as your specific section on oral boards, because you have a choice of doing a specialty section, um, or it would have been seen in the general neurosurgery section as well. So not too complicated. Things that would have been more complicated that would have specifically been seen on the spine section, for example, would have been cases of uh, really large uh, fusion cases with adjacent level disease, uh, scoliosis cases, and we'll get to those maybe later in the year as other uh, trainees come through. 
um, but these are really straightforward uh, spine cases. Um, the first case, uh, although pretty straightforward in terms of imaging, controversial in terms of age, and um, really it was just a test. And every fellow uh, says something different every year about what, how, what, how they treat a 19-year-old Olympian. Um, but I think Dr. Fiber got to the, the case in point. The patient has uh, a uh, spondylo spondylolisthesis, um, grade one with um, bilateral pars fractures. Uh, the right answer would, would be to uh, do a fusion, although he had mentioned artificial disc. If you're going to mention artificial disc, you're going to know how to put an artificial disc in. If you're going to mention an A lift, you're going to mention how you do an A lift. If you're going to do a T lift, we can go into those specific situations. Uh, I didn't delve too much in those situations, but in an exam setting, if you pick a certain type of procedure, know the ins and outs of it. Dr. Uh, Freibert shows T-lift, and I could have asked him about different T-lift complications. They didn't want to get into that. Um, but the other option would have been A-lift. Again, you get A-lift complications and people get into those issues. So be careful about that. The learning point is there was many ways to skin this cat um, and many ways you could treat this patient. Some, some people might have even treated with a laminectomy alone although all these things are very controversial. The idea is that sometimes there is no right answer and examiners just want to push you to see how you think. So that was Dr. Uh, sorry, uh, to clarify, I, I don't think an artificial disc would be appropriate here given the, given the power right. spectrum. Right, right, exactly. So, um, and so basically a fusion would have been appropriate, but know how to skin this cat. And that was the point of this case. Um, the second case, I, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Freiber pulled himself out of the fire a little bit. Um, the key thing here in the exam findings here were swallowing difficulty and twitching. Um, those are not typical, you know, ridiculous signs and not typical myelopathic signs in, the, in, in isolation with just a normal lower extremity exam. And so when you see these really subtle things, the exam is not trying to catch you out, but they do want to see a differential. They do want to go into a differential diagnosis. Um, so this is clearly in a case of ALS. Um, and I would have, uh, you know, I didn't want to push, uh, this is Dr. Freiberg's first time uh, doing this case, oral board review case, but really what you want to do is give your examiner um, at least three or four differentials if they're not surgical. So if it's not surgical, uh, he had mentioned uh, multiple sclerosis or inflammatory disease, transverse myelitis is very, is very common, especially in a young patient. ALS is common. And then the last thing that sometimes can be picked up is, you know, uh, metabolic disturbances, B12 deficiency, copper issues, iron issues, um, basically just some kind of metabolic, uh, you know, um, derangement. And so those are the big ca categories of what you would typically see in this presentation. In this case, a ALS, I didn't get, get into it, but that's one of the most common things that people get caught out on the exam, finding the twitching and the swallowing is, is, the, is the weirdest thing uh, about this. Why would you have swallowing difficulties in, in this setting? Uh, and that should have put the alarm bells out. I didn't get into this, but sometimes if you say ALS is your high, as your primary diagnosis, so I wouldn't have asked Dr. Freibert this, but they may ask you, well, how do you diagnose ALS? You know how to diagnose MS, which is very common. You just get a CSF sample, check for inflammatory markers. The other option for ALS is you need to do uh, an EMG nerve conduction study. And if, if, if we had done this initially before any surgery, the examiner would have given you those kinds of clues. And the one thing I want to point out is when I did the exam, they actually asked me what medication you would use for ALS. And it's uh, uh, Rilazole, Rilazole, um, R-I-L-U-Z-O-L-E. Um, and that medication is shown to decrease ventilator dependence late in the disease. I was asked about that. I was also asked about one of the, uh, one of the side effects of uh, that medication, which includes uh, pulmonary fibrosis and decreased lung function, paradoxically. Um, the third case uh, was a difficult case. It's the kind of case that you would get in the, in the more severe challenging cases of um, this, uh, in, the, in the more challenging sections of the spine specific section. And that is one of these torticollis hypertrophy joint cases where you, know, uh, you see a patient which has a problem uh, who, might, who, have, who has something developed and they will probably need a complex reconstruction. Uh, we didn't go down that route, but you need to, know how to manage a plan for a complex reconstruction of the cranial cervical junction. 
Uh, I didn't want to harass Dr. Freiberg too much because it's the beginning of his fellowship, but they, uh, at, the, uh, at a minimum, they, if, if you're going to do a complex reconstruction of a craniocervical junction, whether it's with an occipital cervical fusion, you've got to know exactly what kind of instruments you're going to use for that, for that what kind of screw trajectory is going to use. So we, don't, we can't do this in the virtual setting, but it's very common, at least uh, when we were able to do this in person, and I think the exam, examination will become an in person eventually. You'll have a spine model, a cranial cervical model. They'll ask you the trajectory of your screws. They'll ask you where you're going to put your screws, the entry points, and how to work this up. The complication is a very common complication uh, for tubal artery injury. Dr. Freiberg did an excellent job of managing that um, with the appropriate stay calm, control bleeding, pack, don't use flow seal finish the screw placement if, you, if the screw is already in there and don't freak out, make sure the patient is stabilized, don't finish the surgery, close the patient, examine the patient, get the patient to angiography, confirm that nothing catastrophic is happening or any active bleeding is still going on. And in this case, no pseudoaneurysm, no active bleeding, check for collateral circulation, make sure you're okay from that standpoint before putting the patient through anything else. Other things that uh, Dr. Freiberg could have also added as a bonus would be stop the patient on aspirin. Akshal, you mind if I interrupt? Sure, yeah. Yeah, um, so just a couple of points on this case, uh, Dr. Freiberg. The first one would be, you mentioned doing a biopsy of this lesion. Can you go back to the, uh, yeah, the CT scan? Um, can you tell me how you biopsy that? Uh, I mean, I know needle biopsies of bony lesions are possible. Uh, uh, so, so tell me, I'm just being a uh, kind of a, a grumpy examiner, sure. but think about where your needle's going. What yeah, structure? It, what structure lies immediately adjacent to where the needle is going to go? Sure, you're, you're threading a very narrow path between the vert and the uh, the. Well, there's vert. no there's no path, right? That's the sulcus arteriosus. So they're not going to do a needle biopsy on that. the The other differential diagnosis when you look at the MRI scan is a. Um, a panis from uh, gout or pseudo gout, right? So those are the two other things you want to mention um, or maybe infection before you see the CT, which confirms it's bony. In terms of the surgery, um, you know, what's typically going to happen is, you, you know, you're called to the OR or if uh, you do the surgery, you elect to do surgery, you put in a screw and you're going to get bleeding. The next question they're going to ask you is, do you put in a screw on the other side? Right, so you want to know what your bailout options are. Um, if you've already put the screw in, the right answer, of course, is to leave the screw in. You already know what the collateral circulation is like because you can see on the CTA, if you scroll through, you can see the right vert while being smaller, it does join up to the left vert. So you want to know what some of the bailout options are, uh, like laminar screws at C2, um, uh, where you can say, look, I don't want to put anything anywhere near that left vert. Um, I'm only going to put screws in the right side and, uh, I'm still comfortable doing, you know, lateral mass screws or something on the, uh, on the, on non-injured side. Uh, those are my points on that. The, the rest is fine. You obviously want to go to angiography. Um, you want to check your neuro monitoring, make sure you haven't, uh, got any changes in monitoring, but, um, you know, leave the screw in, uh, and then consider not putting screws in the other side, depending on your collateralization and your, um, you know, anatomical variances, but I, I would not ask for a biopsy of that. That that would get your examiners uh, annoyed. Gotcha. Uh, case four. Um, I this I think this is uh, pretty self-explanatory in terms of what we're looking for. One of the mo one of the most common uh, cases in the spine section is a thoracic disc and how to deal with that. Um, obviously, uh, you know, recognizing the thoracic disc, recognizing how to how to isolate that certain, certain finer points in this would be, you know, localization. Uh, we didn't get into that, but uh, the examiner could ask, well, how do you localize for that level and how would you do that? And what adjuncts you can do And as many, you can either have your radiologist present in the OR, help you make sure that you're in the right spot. You can have them maybe put a bead in preoperatively to know that you're in the right spot, um, counting appropriately. I don't have all the slides here in the exam, expect the examiner to have all the slides present and have those issues and how to count. So one is counting to get the right, uh, one aspect of this issue is the actual counting to make sure you're in the appropriate level. 
The second thing, uh, and Dr. Freibert mentioned this, is like there's many ways to do this surgery. The wrong answer, there's a, the wrong, the one wrong answer is laminectomy alone, um, or laminectomy and attempted, uh, uh, you know, microdiscectomy. Uh, I think uh, what we touched upon here is that you're going to have to do some form of uh, lateral exposure, whether that's transpedicular, uh, a costal transvasectomy, as a rib takedown, or or something more severe. But the angles to get to this uh, herniated disc uh, are, are all going to be in some kind of lateral for formation, so that you can avoid uh, manipulating the spinal cord in the thoracic region and and, and minimize any trauma to it. Uh, so some so we we mentioned here transpedicular with uh, multi-level fusion, costal transvasectomy is another option, and trying to get back there. Whatever you do. I didn't get into this, but whatever you do, whatever, uh, whatever you pick, there's going to choose a complication related to that. Um, Neuromonitoring is important. Um, and so uh, certain finesse things, you know, Dr. Freiberg, uh, when you do this examination, they're going to be like, they're going to ask you how you can do this. And if you forget to say, you're going to have to have a plan in your mind. You're going to be like, uh, this is out of position, you know, from start to finish, this is how to position, this is what I would have. This is, you know, and you just have to over mention stuff. You say you have a microscope ready, say that you have, um, say that you have neuromonitoring ready, uh, say that all these are kind of the things you just say at the beginning of the case so that it's wrote in your memory that, you know, these are all the things that you're set. Because if you miss saying something, the, the examiner inevitably will ask you like, well, you know, patient wakes up weak, you didn't have neuromonitoring, why didn't you have neuromonitoring, blah, blah, blah. You didn't have a microscope to repair a CSF leak, or if you do a costless transvasectomy, some complication to that part of the procedure. Um, screw placement also. Uh, nowadays, you want to mention how you place screws. I think it's very uh, common to say that you, you, you use navigated screws to the thoracic spine. That's something that's becoming more and more common, uh, or, or what kind of screws you would place, anatomic, trajectory type of screws. You know, all of those things are are common findings. And then the last thing, complication that I didn't bring up, but can be brought up is that you do a CT scan post-op, one of the screws is in the canal, but one of the screws is like lateral. How do you salvage that? What do you do? And all of the issues surrounding that. So um, I didn't get to all that for the sake of time, but that's exactly what the examiner would look for. Uh, case five, uh, you did very well with picking up um, this kind of subtle finding, cord signal change, excellent, you may pick that up. Thoracic spine, excellently picked up uh, the, um, uh, the veins or, or dilated structures in the back here. Um, although we skipped because in the interest of time straight to the case and the dural fistula, I want uh, all the examiners to understand that you could have said that, but the examiners might have stopped you there and be like, what else in your differential? You know, spinal cord tumor pathology, inflammatory pathology, um, basically what else is on that differential before you jump into um, what you think it's going to be. Um, and so that's reason for the examiner to, to ask you that. Uh, so you're going to know all your uh, conal pathology. You're going to know all your um, uh, intramedullary pathology um, and what kind of cancers can be in that, what kind of inflammatory disease can be in that. Have that at the tip of your tongue. Um, and then uh, the dura fistula treated well, uh, you know, again, you know, in preparation for surgery, what I was trying to look for is, you know, having a microscope ready, the approach to down towards the lesion, opening up the dura, um, looking at the nerve root as the, as the site of the dural fistula, um, you know, segment. Uh, you mentioned ICG, which is important, or intraoperative uh, angiogram. Um, neuromonitoring, uh, I think I mentioned really briefly, just to make sure that you're not going to be damaging the core, looking at the dorsal columns, looking at what this might what kind of pathology this might involve. We didn't get, we didn't get into like how you would actually clip this off or treat it, whether it's bipolar, aneurysm clips, ABM clips, but they may get into what you would do. Um, it's not uncommon for, for surgeons to put a temporary clip on what they believe is the, is the pathologic connection and do an ICG just to make sure that that is the true uh, fishless connection or make sure there's no other fishless connections before they do their final uh, resection or bipolaring of that segment, make sure the spinal cord is not going to be at risk. Um, and lastly, because we only have a few minutes, case number six uh, was classic case of, um, I combined two things, and this is, this is one of the more complicated cases that you will see in the spine section of your oral boards, if that's what you do. You won't just see, you know, you won't just see a dense fracture. Uh, you will see a dense fracture plus something else. And it's a dense fracture plus, you know, 
uh, a uh, central cord injury. And I think what, I, what an examiner would look for is if, I think you kind of were trying to say it, Dr. Freiberg, just say it, central cord injury. That's what you, that's what you, that's what was happening here. In addition to uh, high cervical pathology, in this case, dense fracture. I didn't get into the classification scheme and what other therapies you can do for dense fractures and what this would have been uh, and what you could have done. But like I said, you could skin many, you could skin this cat many ways, but you have to take care of the acute fracture pathology, but also the central cord syndrome, which you did and which is very appropriate. Um, yeah, do you have any questions about that? I just want to put a few slides about, you know, like whatever, but do you have any questions about that? No, 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 that was a uh, that was pretty straightforward. I, uh, you know, in retrospect, the 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 bulbar symptoms for the ALS patient there were were pretty clear. But uh, I yeah, no, I think if you're gonna uh, when you do the exam, uh, always expect one of the cases not to be your surgical. Absolutely. Always expect one to in your mind, even if it doesn't turn out that way. Always expect one to be non-surgical. Uh, the first, I think, chapter or two chapters of Greenberg. Uh, I think on the, I'm not even sure if the new edition uh, has this, but there's a section uh, of non neurosurgical uh, diseases in neurology. And that is key to read that right before the exam. You know, it goes through all of the pathologies that might exist in, in the setting of spinal cord disease without, uh, that doesn't, that does not require surgery. Um, and that we touched upon that as well briefly here. Um, with that, I'm gonna end the mock oral board review session. I appreciate your time, Dr. Freibert. Uh, you. you did well, really well. I hope to see you again uh, in one of these sessions later in the year. I don't think anyone has any questions uh on the participant section so we'll end there thanks Corey. thanks dr freiberg thanks, thank, you. thank you thanks, conference. Thank you. have a great day yep thank you